Hey, Miguel here. Welcome back to a new devlog. I'm currently building an untitled RPG with Godot engine that plays in a giant mountain. You are exploring deep caves and discover the mystery that lies deep down below the rock. On your journey, you will meet dwarves, goblins and not so friendly creatures. In the previous episode, I introduced Greetings. Thalnor Colbeard, who is a blacksmith that currently lives in the middle of a procedurally generated cave. While this works fine for a first iteration, it is not something I'm fully happy with. Logically, it doesn't really make sense for a dwarf to build a house in the middle of an empty cave when there is rock all around. As shown in this concept art, I envision my dwarves to live inside houses that are directly carved into the mountain. The locations in my game should be recognizable and unique and it is rather challenging to build puzzles, interesting locations and quests within a fully procedurally generated game. Therefore, I intend to create various custom levels that are connected with one another through procedural generation. Diablo 2 did a great job at that and players didn't even notice the transition from proc gen to custom maps. Unfortunately, the tile map tool in Godot 3 does not allow me to build such levels. The biggest issue for me is the lack of map layers as well as tiled terrains. The cave itself is currently being generated by using the auto tile feature. However, auto tiles are unable to handle transitions to other types of auto tiles very well. Within auto tiling, I must create a new tile map node for every single type of terrain. To solve this issue, I decided to explore the so called tile map editor, which I already used thoroughly for previous projects. It is an amazing open source tool developed by Torbjörn Lindner that is fit for general purpose and is packed with useful features. Most of the concerns with the tile map functionality of Godot 3 are basically addressed here. Its rule based tile placement allows for complex tile drawing across multiple layers and the terrain editor in tiled is quite sophisticated. Of course, I won't bet everything on one horse, so I did a proof of concept first to see how feasible tiled would be. I started by creating a new tile set with Sprite that follows the terrain format required to properly draw terrain within the editor. What makes terrain special is that you can specify transitions between different types of terrain. Once that was done, I defined the terrain within tiled by using the terrain tool and started drawing a basic map. Now that I had a tile map, I somehow had to load it into Godot engine. On GitHub there is a tiled loader add-on available that I installed and activated within Godot. It generates a TSCN file from any TMX file in the game folder and creates a ready to use scene for you. Obviously launching that scene on its own will not look great since camera, environment and lighting are all missing. To fix that I created a new wrapper scene and place the UI, lighting and a player into the scene tree. Starting that scene looked much closer to how I'd expect Cave to look. With a mechanism in place to design these levels, I started wondering how I could possibly place things like torches, NPCs, furnaces and other game objects in tiled. All that information currently only exists within Godot. Tiled supports the concept of objects and a recent version introduced custom classes that can have their own name and attributes. Utilizing that feature allows me to write GD script that iterates through all these objects within Godot and places the game objects into the scene tree. For NPCs though, this becomes rather tricky. How could I specify behaviors within tiled? In Godot, I attach a behavior tree node to an NPC as a child and then link up the furnace, oil bath and anvil node paths. I would need to replicate this workflow somehow within tiled as well. One fix for this could be to look up the anvil, furnace and oil bath that are close to the player within the game code. However, I wanted to ensure NPCs always return to a dedicated spot. Also, I had plans to introduce puzzles into the game and required a mechanism to link up levers and doors accordingly. To solve this, Tiled Editor supports so-called object references and it allowed me to link up the oil bath, the anvil and the furnace to the behavior class on the NPC object. 
I quickly realized though that the tiled add-on for Godot did not support this correctly, so I did what I always do when some feature is missing. I just edit myself. After a long Saturday of coding, I managed to get it working and raised a pull request on GitHub to the official add-on. When starting the game now, the behavior gets correctly injected and Thalno can forge. Happy days. At this point, I worked on the tilt experiment for almost three weeks already, and the longer I worked on it, the more I noticed something rather strange. Doing a simple change, like placing an item somewhere, required me to not only save the tile project, but in addition, I also must head back into Godot Engine and restart the game. This felt like a true downgrade compared to the old real-time experience where I could modify tile maps while the game was running. Another thing I noticed is that Tilt had some bugs around defining its classes and types. Sometimes defaults would not correctly inherit and I was digging for hours because certain attributes would not change correctly in-game. Worst of it all though, I now had to maintain two additional models that I had to extend whenever I wanted to add any content to the game. First I had to tell the tilt editor about NPCs, items, behaviors and how they relate to each other and then I had to map those objects to Godot C nodes. At this point I was pretty burnt out and I lost motivation. I did spend countless hours trying to make this work and the sunken cost fallacy has taken over control. I wondered if my ideas were too ambitious and if I should just stick with good old procedural generation and call it a day. No more RPG, no more custom built scenes. Goodbye dwarfs. I'm just kidding. I will not give up so quickly. After all, Tilt was an experiment for a reason and I decided to get back to work. It was time to throw my existing experiment into the blazing furnace and instead start thinking about what I actually need to make this game a reality. I require minimal overhead to create new content, ideally with real-time feedback to create and modify the game at runtime. I want tile terrain support and tile map layers. One engine to rule them all. It is probably going to take a few more years until this game is finished and having to work with Godot 3 for such a long time is something I'm now questioning. Some of you might know from the thumbnail of this video where I'm going with this. What if I, hypothetically, simply use Godot 4 instead? Smart. It comes with a sophisticated tile map editor that addresses all of the issues I'm having at the moment. Remember those cyclic GD script issues that prevented me from making my entire codebase strictly typed? Those days are gone. Godot 4 comes with a fresh GD script implementation that even supports lambda functions, custom resource exports, typed signals, Vulkan rendering and um, getting ahead of myself. The first problem is that I cannot just use Godot 4. Although, at the date of making this video, Godot 4 is in beta and I can just download and use the engine, my game will not run. This project uses a set of add-ons such as Dialogic, Fmod and Behavior Tree Logic. None of these Godot add-ons support Godot 4 yet. In order to truly upgrade to a new engine, I had to make sure all add-ons are compatible with the new engine version first. For Thelnos AI, I used a behavior tree example project by Vinicius Gerovini that is not compatible with version 4 of Godot. To solve that, I created a completely new Godot add-on called Behave. Then contributor Gareth Somers ported the existing GD script code over to Godot 4. In future, I have many additional plans for this add-on, so feel free to check it out in the description of this video. For the Fmod Studio add-on, things were a bit more tricky. If you are curious why I'm using Fmod as an audio engine, this will be explained in a future video. The thing to remember is that Fmod is an external library that does not automatically work with Godot engine. To make it work, someone created a GD native extension for it that allows me to use Fmod in my game. In a nutshell, you will write some C++ code and then connect it via GD script. With Godot 4, 
this has changed and you are able to write so-called GD extensions instead. The main difference is that these extensions can access the Godot C++ API itself as if it was part of the engine core and you don't need to write any GD script to wrap things. This means that you can completely customize the engine with C++, even introduce completely new node types that are natively available within Godot when activating your extension as an add-on. I started looking at the blog posts that announced GD extensions and started the upgrade. The first big hurdle was to be able to compile the GD extension. You build any GD extension the same way you would compile Godot itself, via the sconstruct tool. Simply type scons target editor into your command line and watch the magic unfold. There was much less magic for me though, as I was greeted by a tsunami of compilation errors. And this is where my journey of endless suffering started. Once I finally managed to compile the GD extension, I bundled up the DLL files in my add-ons folder and attempted to load the add-on without success. More sleepless nights followed and over 60 commits later, I finally managed to play sound with fmod in Godot 4. Things are still rough and I'm actively discussing with the core maintainers to redesign the entire architecture, but that will most likely happen after the migration is completed. My last devlog has shown how I made Thelenor Colbeard talk by using the Dialogic plugin. Emilio is currently building version 2 of Dialogic that is built on top of Godot 4. Let's hear what he has to say. Hey Miguel, hello everyone. So I wanted to take advantage of this opportunity of having Godot 4 new features to take a step back and rethink what Dialogic could be and how I would have made everything better if I started from scratch. And we basically did just that. We started from scratch with the same concept concept and the same goal, but with a new code base, all based in Godot 4. There were a lot of things that were hard-coded in Dialogic 1 that are not anymore, so you are able to make any kind of layout you want. You can also write timelines using text, and you can even use an external editor to open your timelines and edit them there. Of course, together with Godot 4, we are still under development and there are many things that are going to be changing, especially in Dialogic 2, we are still in alpha and every new Godot version usually changes a few things, but we try to keep our main branch in the repository always up to date. But you might find that you lose some data in the way and things may crash. It's not only me, there's also a lot of people that are contributing in making Dialogic better, but for now, everything is a little bit experimental. But I hope you like it. I'm so thrilled to hear about all that amazing progress and I used the alpha version already. I will show you in a future video how that works. Once all the add-ons were compatible with Godot 4, it was finally time to start migrating the game code itself. When opening a Godot 3 project with Godot 4 for the first time, a pop-up will appear. This internally uses a conversion tool that ships out of the box with the Godot executable. It's quite neat. Unfortunately, that process may not convert all the GD script files out of the box. I had to manually migrate some bits like setget myself. As you can see by the number of errors at startup, this was not an easy task. My strategy was to first delete all the add-ons from the add-ons folder, then comment out everything that currently breaks and then bit by bit start reintroducing functionality. Here are a few of my favorite things in Godot 4 that I could instantly take advantage of. Signals are now actual types. Thanks to the support of lambda functions in GDScript, I can simply connect signals directly to functions. No more string shenanigans. Exports within scripts have become much simpler now. Rather than always exporting a resource, you can now specify custom resources. I use this a lot now to export item resources that can be injected within the editor. Remember those times where you had to inject a node path and then look up the node from there that is no longer required and you can simply export any node that can be set. Cyclic dependencies are finally gone. I'm now able to use types everywhere. A lot of folks ask me why they should spend time on defining types everywhere. This has a lot of advantages. First, the code becomes instantly more readable. It is now much easier to understand what types exist in your code. Then there is auto-completion. Thanks to types, Godot will give you auto-completion for free. Another advantage is performance. Not 
specifying a type forces Godot to do additional lookup checks behind the scenes. With types, you will save potentially precious computation time. Once I refactored most of GD's script, it was finally time to fix the game itself. Starting the game revealed that something wasn't quite right. The lighting seemed to be absolutely scuffed. A look on the GitHub repository revealed that there were several lighting bugs reported in Godot 4. However, nobody volunteered to fix it. And this is how I became a Godot contributor. The fix was rather trivial. A few lines of GLSL shader code had to be tweaked and erased PRs for both of the canvas shading and the light rendering issues itself. After my changes were merged, I proceeded fixing most of the UI styling. I tried to make it look like the old version, however, I want to replace the entire UI with a theme in future. Themes were drastically overhauled in Godot 4 and I cannot wait to finally introduce a consistent UI theme across my entire game flow. To my relief, font rendering in Godot 4 has been overhauled as well and I can now use the font size to scale fonts down to pixel perfect dimensions. In Godot 3 I had to wrap my labels inside a Node2D node and use the scale property on them. That hack is no more. With Godot 4, I want to completely rewrite the cave generation. The current implementation has its flaws, most notably the lack of variety and the limited size of generated cave tunnels. For now, I just upgraded the cave generator to be Godot 4 compatible, but in future I want to replace it with a better solution. The noise in Godot 4 got a major upgrade and there is now an actual noise UI inside the editor. Quite neat. Another major change was the tile map itself. As shown in a previous tutorial on this channel, you could generate caves in Godot 3 by using auto tiling. That got completely removed and is now replaced by a terrain tool. The main difference here is that terrains can define transitions and allow for better drawing of textures on the same layer. Talking of layers, instead of creating multiple tile maps like you had to do in Godot 3, your scene can now host a single tile map node containing multiple layers. With the rewrite of the procedural generation, I finally want to introduce infinite caves with biomes and dynamic chunk loading unloading. Stay tuned for that. This surely was a massive undertaking, but I can finally claim that I upgraded to Godot 4. Of course, there are still some bits like dialogues and minor visual tweaks that I have to apply to return to the original level of polish, but I'm quite happy with the result. The next devlog will focus purely on new content and thanks to Godot 4, there are some drastic changes coming up. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell button. You can play the latest version of Cave on my Discord. The link is below in the description. I see you next time. May your forge burn bright.